Hi, I'm Anna Raimondi, coming to you from sunny Florida today. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. I am so happy and excited to welcome my guest today, William Schroeder. Dr. Bill, as he likes to be called, is a board certified internal medicine specialist and a molecular biologist. He completed coursework at the University of Arizona School of Medicine under Dr. Andrew Weil. He has been involved in both local hands-on and distant energy healing and has had wonderful results. Dr. Bill is in the closing stages of writing a book about his treatment of patients using these techniques. And his new book is called A Perfect Falcon, A Physician's Journey in Consciousness Healing. Welcome, I'm so happy to have you here. Um, you're a physician and a molecular biologist. How did you get involved in energy healing? Well, I became a physician after studying since age four um, because of the result of multiple family illnesses. I was very sick as a child, had a serious illness uh, erupt in my mother around age seven and decided to take a vow to become a doctor, uh, not realizing that I was also taking a vow to become a healer, which I have now, uh, I'm proud to say, have become. Uh, there's a difference between just being a doctor and a healer. Healer is more inclusive. You address the physical, emotional, and spiritual aspects of a human being, whereas most physicians really only address the physical. So my transition to healer involved a very unusual set of circumstances that require a little bit of explanation. I was practicing as a doctor, an internal medicine specialist, adult medicine. We do everything except deliver babies and do major surgery. And I joined a group of physicians who were in the inaugural, the initial class at the University of Arizona School of Medicine's uh, an associate program in integrative medicine under Dr. Andrew Weil, as you mentioned. And one day I was sitting on the veranda of a beautiful resort in uh, Arizona, sunny Arizona in the wintertime. And I was drinking a beer and shooting the breeze with my fellow uh, doctors in the program. And I overheard someone talking about working with an energy healer. And we had had some tr didactic academic training in energy medicine in the course, but I interrupted immediately because that sounded wonderful to me. And I'd always wanted to look at that. So the following summer, I was involved in an experiment done at the University of Arizona School of Medicine in energy healing with about 50 of my fellow um, healers, doctors, uh, nurses, psychologists. And that's how I was introduced to energy medicine. What had happened was that the university had a paranormal investigator who is a professor of medicine at the university by the name of Gary Schwartz. PhD is quite famous as an investigator and an author. He's written, I think, half a dozen books that some of which are, uh, sold quite a few uh, copies about energy healing, a very intelligent, remarkable human being. And he designed an experiment. And in this experiment, he wanted to see if you could teach ordinary run-of-the-mill healthcare practitioners how to take energy from the environment and run it out their hands and sense energy. And the type of energy we're talking about is subtle energy. Uh, a lot of people don't understand the distinction, but there's various types of energy. We can think of electricity and sunlight and as energy, and those are very available to the five senses. Subtle energies are not easily apprehended or appreciated by the five senses. And from this point onward, I like to call that chi, Q-I or C-H-I, for reference, you know, as we talk. 
But basically, some people can see them, my teacher included, and some people can feel them, which includes myself and almost every patient I've worked with. So they're not so subtle once you recognize them. Uh, they are real uh, and powerful. So we went down to uh, a place south of Tucson after being investigated with curly and photography devices and EEG machines and gamma counters. They pointed all this machinery at us and tested whether we could sense energy coming out of other people's bodies. And I met a teacher there by the name of Rosalind Brie, who is quite accomplished and very famous. Um, she's a contemporary and uh, worked with Barbara Brennan, which most people recognize uh, to some degree because Barbara Brennan is much more famous. Well, anyway, Rosalind taught me how to run energy, which basically involves taking subtle energy out of the environment, concentrating it, accelerating it, and emitting it out your hands. For the purpose of the experiment, we were going to emit it out of the center of our hands and see if the other person could sense it. Uh, this research was positive. In other words, you could teach somebody how to do that very quickly. And it was published in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine in 2004. And they correlated it with something called absorption, the ability of a person to become very deeply involved in sensory experiences. And uh, I was proud to be part of that. I'm kind of a laboratory animal that escaped the experiment, however, because basically I continued to train. The reason I did that was immediately, I go back to my clinic, solo clinic, and I have a patient come in. And this patient had horrible knee pain, severe knee pain, just devastating, and uh, could not bend his knee to the point where he could even walk. So I put my hand on either side of his knee and pulled energy from the ground into my belly and emitted it out my knee, taking the energy and moving it back and forth in a forceful manner through his knee, a technique that I had been taught in about 15 minutes during this energy experiment. And about, I would say two minutes into the treatment, Bam, the pain goes away. I had the patient stand up and their mobility was restored. Now realize that this is something that I had never been able to do with even the most advanced techniques of modern medicine. And I had been able to do it after a short period of training. And it launched my career as an energy healer. And so that's how I became an energy healer. You know, it's interesting because I'm an energy healer as well. I'm not a doctor. Um, but when, you know, I teach people, you know, everybody's like, well, I can't do it. I can't do it. We're made of energy. Okay. And if you hold up your hand and you feel it kind of bouncing back and forth for all of you out here there who want to try this, you will feel the energy of the people. You feel it every day. You're just not conscious of it. The more conscious you are of it, you know, the more you can integrate it into your life. But also when you're doing energy healing, um, there also has to be an intention. So do you, when you were working on that person's knee, I guess the intention was to, you know, help remedy the problem. Yes? That's, that is correct. And, you know, basically, well, I should never say basically because my wife will kill me if I say basically again. However, <laughs> what, it based, what it boils down to is that we can move these subtle energies with human intent, which is perhaps one of the most mysterious aspects of this, because you're correct. We move energy through our body, through our bloodstream, through our lymphatics, through our nerves, through our muscles, through every part of our body on a daily basis. And we get used to them, so we don't think, regard them as subtle. These types of energy can be felt and seen by some individuals, and we can use them with our willpower, our intent to heal. Well, I didn't know that in 2001 when I underwent this experience. And I had spent around 30 years of my career being a doctor without the benefit of energy medicine. 
I subsequently went, this is fabulous. And I started to treat people on a daily basis Where and have been doing that. Where healing is coming from? You say you pull it from the earth. What is, what is the energy about? Who's doing the healing? Well, my own opinion is it's not me, but that I am a conduit uh, for this force. And we can call it energy. It, it gets a little confusing as to what it actually is for people. But it's a force that is natural. And you're restoring the movement of this with your own intent as a surrogate, but you're you basically. What do you mean by natural? So is it earth energy? Is it... Yes, it is. So you don't That's typically that, what it is. Um, you don't believe the healing comes from God or divinity or the power that is or anything like that. It can, but you don't have to call on God for this type of healing. I'm a Christian and I believe that my training has been enhanced by my belief in, in God and my Christianity. So their person's spirituality is a accelerant uh, to healing. And I do believe in disembodied beings. Uh, I believe in Jesus. I believe in angels. They have had contact with disembodied beings. And if you call on them, they will come to help you which is an extra bonus because they can also help you with not only with physical healing, but emotional and spiritual healing as well. Well, when you talk about earth energy, what is earth energy? I mean, isn't that divine? Absolutely. To me, there is nothing that is not divine. I don't separate man from creator, uh, from the universal mind. I don't think there's any difference. Uh, I think that there is a source of everything and we become confused and enter into illusion when we believe that we are separate from that force. And some people call that just being a human being. Uh, losing that connection can cause physical illness and can cause emotional problems and certainly causes spiritual problems. So I regard this as a form of spiritual healing uh, in the sense that it does that, but it is also natural in the sense that you would look at it from a physical perspective. It has a physical presence. So I don't believe that anyone has to believe in any particular deity to receive this type of healing. Uh, this is part of being human. Now, I don't think if, it has to do with the person receiving it. I think that, as you said before, you're a conduit. You know, I, I believe that when people put their ego in it and say, I healed you, it's like, no, you didn't heal me. Um, something, this energy that moved through you into me is what healed me. Um, and I think that's important, you know, to keep in mind. You know, a belief in God, a belief in a power, a belief in energy, vibration, um, it doesn't matter. You know, whatever it is, it's a, it's a belief that you partner with going through your body. Yes, you're one with the energy, but it's a, it's a conscious partnership. And so that you're able to help the other, the other person. Um, have you seen, you know, say you're working on somebody and they have a heart issue, that they are healed somewhere else as well? Yes, and <clears throat> this is a little bit, I'm sorry? Without the intention to go to the other place. Correct. Uh, one of the surprises that I encountered as an energy healer, you know, as a physician, we look at physical parts. We are dividers. Um, many of my patients, once I taught them how to run energy had spontaneous healings in multiple sites, some of which I wasn't even aware of at the time that they started their process of healing. So it's, <laughs> the body has the capacity to naturally heal. And this is always going to be true. 
when you are a healer, you are providing kind of the momentum for that. And when the when this gathers, you're basically supposed to get out of the way and allow the healing to occur. Uh, I have a very good friend who I work with who says he does nothing. And he insists that he does nothing, uh, although I'm not quite so sure. He is a conduit for healing, but he recognizes that in the state that he goes to to facilitate healing, he is actually doing nothing. And that's precisely what it feels like to me. Part of it is a little bit of theater because the patient expects you to do something. And so there are some instances where we get healing when I am helping, but for the most part, the more powerful and total healings come without my intervention at all. Uh, there shouldn't be any fear because it's not you. It is not me. And that's part of the joy of it. It takes a lot of pressure off. Uh, so yeah. people ask me, like, if I'm on a stage and there's a thousand people, how do I not get nervous? Because it's not me. You know, yeah, I mean, I have no control of what I'm feeling coming through me, but it's not me. And I open my mouth and I let it go. You know, and the energy has divine, innate intelligence. And if you want to take out divine, take out divine. But it has innate intelligence to go where it needs to go. And so there is no fear. It's all good. Right? And once the person says, I want to be healed, there you go. Do you find more and more doctors are open to this? Slightly. It, we're at kind of like the pre-dawn era in the West. Uh, the West is so involved with its own model of illness that it will take some time, perhaps even decades for energy medicine to be introduced into standard Western methodologies. And I think the time has come for it. There, the research is accelerating. We're now starting to see research that not only proves that it is real, but shows us that we can integrate this with our standard Western medical therapies. I am not a proponent of someone abandoning Western medical techniques. I'm a proponent of someone integrating this because it can be integrated and it works best when integrated. The idea that energy medicine will always replace standard Western medicine is a fallacy. Mm -hmm. it, it can, but that's the same way that a pill might replace my energy medicine. There's many times when I go, well, my energy medicine isn't going to work. And I have had many failures. And I've kind of said, well, I hope this does it because I don't have much left. And sometimes I will succeed, sometimes I will fail. And then you move on and you fight again. You live to fight again. And people are so precious. The human soul is so beautiful and precious that it's very hard for me to give up. I'm kind of a bulldog when I get involved at this. I keep fighting for my patients and I will fight with whatever wins the battle, whether it's an herb or a homeopathic remedy or energy medicine or my drug surgery or radiation. That is to reject any of those modalities is to limit oneself. And that's where integrative medicine comes in. Now, integrative medicine is teaching energy medicine in major medical schools across the nation as a result of Dr. Weil's efforts. And that is where I think the energy healers that are potentially listening today should take hope. We have an army of extremely talented energy healers. There's not many in the medical profession who have MDs or DOs behind their names, but there are RNs, there are uh, PhDs, there are psych Ds, people with master's degrees, and people from all walks of life some of whom are unbelievably talented energy healers. 
at some point they are going to be integrated into our medical system. And I think it's time for them to prepare because it's not far away. I think that a lot of um, psychologists and psychiatrists have been more open to it. You know, I mean, you know, I, 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 the books that many of the books that are written by doctors are coming from people in those fields, which kind of makes sense, you know, um, and it, it, and then it flows through to everybody else, but it's very exciting when it enters the medical community, because if energy healing shakes hands with, you know, modern medicine, that's where the healings truly begin. You know, that's where it also opens people up. So it's not just about being healed, it's being opened up to something else that exists and that they can hold on to. What state are you in? I'm in Colorado, I'm in central Colorado. And do you have, um, are most of your patients, do they come to you because they know you're an energy healer and a doctor? Or do you have people coming to you and you say, can I try this? The majority are in the last case you mentioned. However, I have a large number of patients who come to me because they know I'm an energy healer and they want that technique. I have chose the place that I practice because the administration at that hospital knew that I was an energy healer and an integrative physician and allow me to do that. Uh, many other places would not have allowed me to do that. Oh, really? Because if you're yeah. a doctor, what if you were a lay person? Would they let you do energy healing in the hospital if you were not in the medical profession? You know, I don't think so. Uh, mostly because of its legal uh, um, uh, implications. Uh, it's basically, it, it's a truism that people are now protecting themselves financially from accusations of you did this and it hurt me or, you know, uh, litigation, malpractice. And so because the establishment bureaucracy does not understand energy medicine or other integrative techniques, they're afraid of them uh, from a legal standpoint. Uh, that has that is the major barrier to the introduction of energy medicine into because they have Western medicine um, in New York. They have energy healers in the hospital in Connecticut. They do. I mean, Sloan Kettering does. I mean, it's your choice to go to them. They don't, you know, say you have to. Um, and I'm sure you have you sign a waiver. Um, and they're not. It's not being done by doctors. It's being done by you know people who practice Reiki or the Barbara Brennan way of doing it or whatever else is out there. Um, it's, it's, pretty, um, it's, it's pretty widespread in the New York metropolitan area. I would think it'd be the same in Colorado. It's pretty open. It should, it should be, uh, but it is not uh, at this point. Um, it will change. As soon as people realize how effective it is, doctors will change their minds. The majority of doctors have great compassion. And once they understand a technique will help their patient, they will find it. They will get it for their patient. What's happening right now is there's a sea change and it's slow, but it's real. The major problem is not the physicians, it's the bureaucracy and the lawyers. Mm -hmm. That once that is overcome, that, it, the floodgates will open. Yeah, it's always the case. Uh, yeah. And you know what? I get. I mean, listen. I have a son in law school, but I mean, the minute you get involved and the lawyers get involved, oh, it's just it's it stops everything. It stops progress. So, when is your book coming out? Well, I've got about eighty percent of it written. About three months ago, I decided that I needed to have an online course because much of the material requires visual instruction. And I have about 20% done with that. And I am planning on publishing the book and the course around the same time. Because I'm a physician, there will be skepticism and opposition to what I am saying. 
And that'll be interesting. And I do harbor some fear that I will be attacked. Uh, I that I, so. well, I hope not. I mean, Evan Alexander, <laughs> I mean, he talks about a near death experience. He's, you know, he's a neurosurgeon. Um, yeah, he was attacked a little bit, but it didn't stop him. It's not going to stop you. Well, yeah, it, it won't stop me. I'm just planning. I'm planning retirement. So I'm trying to make it so that I don't end up in some type of controversy with somebody who doesn't understand what I'm doing and get into embroiled in something like that. So I'm planning on retiring in maybe three to five years. And I'm planning on this book coming out in about four to six months. Uh, and so do you have a publisher or are you self-publishing it? I'm self-publishing. Okay. And people will be able to get it on Amazon? I presume so. I, you know, I haven't, this will be my first book. So it's kind of like a new baby. You don't know what it's going to do until it's, it has been born. So you, you, are you, you don't know if you're going to publish through Amazon? Not that I'm touting Amazon. <laughs> well, that appears to be the best way to do it at this point as yeah, I investigate. Right to Amazon from what I understand. You know, in a lot of ways, I mean, I published with a big publisher and I self-published. Self-publishing is pretty good. You're yeah. more in control. Um, well, I wish you the best. And I thank you for what you're bringing to the world. Um, you know, when I wrote conversations with Mary, you know, she said that I asked her, well, you know, it's coming through to doctors now. And her answer was, well, sure, because we respect doctors in our culture. And if a doctor says it, then we listen, you know, so, um, you know, kudos to you for stepping out, you know, let your intention be that it's going to do great, no fear, and it will be wonderful. So thank you very much for coming on. And thank you for all of you for listening to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. You can catch us anytime on SoundCloud or on YouTube on my channel at Anna Raimondi. So if you want to re-listen to this episode or listen to other episodes, go right ahead. In the meantime, God bless you all and thank you so much, Dr. Bill.